Hello and welcome to a multi-part series about the card game Magic the Gathering. The first video in the series will be going over card types as well as the overall basics of the game. Other videos in the series will go over format, strategy, obtaining or buying cards, gameplay etiquette, and anything else that really comes to mind. Before we get into the card types though, I suppose I should show you what means what on these cards as the layout can be a little bit overwhelming to a newer player. Here is a creature card called Sarah Angel. In the top left hand corner of the card you will find the name. In the top right hand you will find the mana cost. Sarah Angel costs 2 white mana, signified by the 2 white sun marks, and 3 mana of any other type signified by the number 3 in a gray circle. Below the name and mana cost, you will find the art. Most cards are recognized by their art, and it's kind of the iconic thing about Magic the Gathering in my opinion. If you ever want to know who did the art for a card, look at the bottom part of the card. The artist's name will have a small paintbrush icon next to it. Below the card art to the left will be another line of text signifying the card type and any other relevant information regarding the card type. In Sarah Angel's case, it signifies that it's a creature and an angel type creature. To the right of the card type text, you'll find the set symbol. This is used to signify which set this particular card was printed or reprinted in. Magic has been around since 1993, so it's important to signify where this card was from. I wouldn't worry too much about memorizing these, since it really isn't that important unless you start getting into the collecting aspect of the game. The color of this symbol also signifies the rarity of the card. A black symbol means the card is of common rarity. A silver symbol means it's an uncommon. A gold symbol means this card is rare. And a red symbol means this is a mythic rarity card. The symbol does not dictate how good the card is though. Typically, yes, mythics and rares have more effects than uncommons and uncommon rarity cards, but that doesn't really make them better. Below this line of text is a large box. This is where the card's effects can be found, as well as flavor text for the card to help build the lore around it. For Sarah Angel, it tells us that this creature has flying and vigilance. Since this printing came from one of the core sets, those keywords flying and vigilance also describe what that particular effect does. Since space here is limited, keywords often do not have those descriptions on them. Most of them are fairly easy to understand and memorize once you've played the game a little bit. If you ever have a card where you don't know what the keyword requires, requires you to do, go to gatherer.wizards.com. This site contains information on the cards as well as the oracle text for each card. Oracle text is the most up-to-date wording of a card and its particular mechanics. On the bottom right hand part of this box we will find the attack and defense of the card, assuming that it's a creature type. Sarah Angel is a 4-4, meaning that she deals 4 damage when she attacks and takes 4 damage to kill her. Other examples of this are Elite Vanguard, which is a 2-1. This card is able to deal 2 damage, but can only take 1 damage before it dies. Since you probably have that question, yes there are cards out there with very high attack values and no defense, like Ball Lightning. There are also cards out there with very high defense values with no attack power, like Tree of Perdition. On the bottom row of the card frame you can find other information like how many cards are in this set that it was printed in, as well as which number in the set this card is. Now onto the actual card types. As of January 2017 there are 7 different card types, Land, Creature, Sorcery, Instant, Enchantment, Artifact, and Planeswalker. Furthermore, a card can be considered legendary in its card type. The legendary card type basically means that you cannot control duplicate copies of that one card at any given time. If you do end up controlling two of the same legendary card, you must put one into the graveyard. Lands are kind of the resource of the game. You can play one per turn and you can use them to play all of your other spells. To signify that a land has been used, you turn it from its vertical position to a horizontal one. This is called tapping. Insert your sophomore innuendos here. A land can be tapped at any time to produce a mana which can be used on spells. Lands come in many different types, but they can be basically broken down into basic and non-basic lands. Basic lands only produce one color of mana signified by their name. Plains produce white mana, mountains produce red mana, swamps produce black mana, islands produce blue mana, and forests produce green mana. Non-basic lands are kind of all over the place. They can tap for one of multiple colors, as seen by these dual lands, they can tap for multiple sources of colorless mana as well. They can have benefits when they enter the battlefield, or they can have other utility like recurring things from your graveyard. Some lands don't even produce mana. 
Creatures are the next card type. Creatures are usually what people use to win the game by attacking the other player. When you play a creature, it has summoning sickness. This means that it cannot activate any abilities that require it to be tapped or attack until your next turn. To signify that a creature is attacking, you tap it during your combat step. Creatures can only attack other players or Planeswalker cards. Creatures will also occasionally have different effects on them. Some of them happen when they enter the battlefield. For example, this mirror battle sphere creates four other creatures when it enters the battlefield. A creature like Scavenging Ooze has an ability that can be used at any time for one green mana. This card, Bird of Paradise, actually has the ability to tap and create a mana of any color. Since this ability requires it to tap to activate, it cannot be done the turn it comes down though. Sorceries are the next card type. These are spells that can be only cast on your turn during one of your main phases. They cannot be cast during your combat step. Their effects range from making your opponents discard cards, to drawing your entire deck, to making tons of copies of creatures, or to just destroying everything on the board. Instants are similar to sorceries, except that they can be cast during any phase of both you and your opponent's turns. Instants typically have cards like Giant Growth, which can make one of your creatures bigger, or cards like Lightning Bolt, which can quickly deal 3 damage to either a player or a creature. Instants are also home to the lovely counter spells. This is a type of spell that will counter another player's spell, as the name implies, or impose some other condition on a spell being cast. For example, counter spell costs two blue mana and will counter any spell. Or mana leak, which costs a blue mana and then any other color of mana, and it will counter a spell unless that spell's controller pays additional mana to cast it. Other counter spells like hinder or remand attempt to disrupt your opponent's overall game tempo. You You've probably noticed that a lot of the counter spells so far are blue. There are indeed other colors of counter spells. Things like Red Elemental Blast or Pyroblast are red spells designed to counter blue cards. Another one, Guttural Response, is a card that can be cast using either green or red mana to counter a blue spell. Both instants and sorceries typically only get used once. Once they're cast, they are put into the graveyard and not used again. There are other effects out there to recast them, but we'll get into those in a later video. Next up for card types are enchantments. There are permanents that come onto the battlefield and typically have some sort of lasting game effect. For example, Oblivion Ring is a popular enchantment that will remove another non-land card on the battlefield from the game, as long as Oblivion Ring is in play. Other effects are things like Rest in Peace, which remove the graveyard from play, or Knight of Souls Betrayal, which gives every creature in play minus one, minus one. Enchantments typically have a lot of utility, but don't win you the game on the spot. They are difficult to remove since it usually takes a spell or ability that specifically targets enchantments to get rid of. Artifacts are the next type of card. Artifacts are similar to enchantments in that they come onto the battlefield and have some sort of lasting game effect or overall utility to offer. Artifacts are also not affected by summoning sickness, so their abilities can be used once they come onto the battlefield. Again, they are typically difficult to remove since people have to use specific artifact removal against them. As a side note, both artifacts and enchantments can also be creatures. Since they are of the creature type, they are indeed affected by summoning sickness. There are plenty of artifact creatures to be found throughout the history of magic, and there are a few creature enchantments from the Theros block of cards. The final card type is Planeswalker. Planeswalkers were added into the game around 10 years ago and are treated as another player in the game. Kind of. They follow the legendary rule and you cannot have more than one Planeswalker type on the battlefield. I make that distinction because multiple characters from the story have multiple Planeswalkers out now. For example, I cannot have Chandra the Firebrand and Chandra Flame of Kaladesh under my control at the same time. But you can have two differing Planeswalkers, like any Chandra or any Jace. Now, Planeswalkers work in kind of a weird way. In the bottom right hand corner of the card you'll see a number. In the case of Garuk Wildspeaker, that number is 3. When he enters the battlefield, he comes in with 3 loyalty counters on him. Once he has entered the battlefield, you may use one of his abilities. This will either increase or decrease the amount of loyalty counters on him. Typically, a Planeswalker card will have a plus ability, a minus ability, and another minus ability that's kind of an ultimate effect. In Garuk's case, you can add one loyalty counter to him to untap two lands, or you can remove a loyalty counter from him to make a 3-3 creature token. The loyalty counter abilities can only be activated once during your turn. They cannot be activated during opponent's turns. 
Earlier, I said that Planeswalkers are kind of treated as another player. If an opponent has a Planeswalker out and you want to remove loyalty counters from it, you must directly attack the Planeswalker card instead of attacking your opponent. Or, if you have an instant spell like Lightning Bolt, you must first target your opponent with the spell. If they do not counter it, then you may decide to redirect the damage to the Planeswalker card. Alright, that about does it for explaining the card types. I kind of overlooked one though. You probably noticed Planeswalker Garruk can make a 3-3 token. What's a token? The token card types are generally created by spells, effects, or other abilities. They are usually creatures, but can also be generic artifacts or enchantments. There are tons of tokens out there, and every set will print any relevant tokens with it. That being said, you probably will encounter a situation where you don't have the specific tokens you need for an effect. In that case, you can use anything to represent that token. Dice, coins, marbles, a banana, it doesn't really matter as long as both players understand what that object is representing. Now, time to move into a brief overview of playing the game. I'm going to go ahead and let you know that there are a ton of formats for this game, with small little variations on the rules. So this section will only go over a typical turn in the game, and not go over things like deck construction, since that varies widely depending on the format. Here's a general layout of a game. Depending on if you are left or right-handed, place your deck on one side of the playing area. Typically below that, you will place cards into the graveyard. When playing, you should generally place your creatures above your lands like this. You want to make sure your opponent can easily tell what you have on the battlefield and not have your lands and creatures all mixed up. To start the game, each player draws 7 cards. You want to have a good combination of spells and lands in your opening hand. If you do not, you may shuffle the cards that you drew into your deck, reshuffle your deck, and then draw 6 cards. You can continue to mulligan the cards until you have a satisfactory hand. If you mulliganed, you may look at the top card of the library and decide if you want that card. If you do, leave it on top of the library. If you don't, you may put it on the bottom library. This mechanic is called scrying. Alright, each turn has a few separate phases that you go through. They are separated into the untap, upkeep, draw, first main, combat, which is broken into different phases itself, second main, and end phases. The untap step is the first thing you do every turn. This phase is there so you untap the creatures that attacked, untap lands, and anything else. If anything is tapped and there isn't something prohibiting it from untapping, untap it. Then you can move to the upkeep phase. The upkeep phase generally doesn't have anything going on in it. On occasion, there are creatures or other effects that will be applied during your upkeep phase though, so it is something to be aware of. The draw phase comes next. This is where you draw your card for the turn. You can play instants and activate other instant speed abilities during your untap, upkeep, and draw phases. It's very important that you follow the phases in this precise order. Next is your first main phase. This is where you can cast sorcery spells, creatures, artifacts, enchantments, and play lands. Generally, you start the turn by playing a land if you have one. Then, depending on the board state, you can move to combat or cast other spells if need be. If you have leftover mana that you didn't spend during this phase, it goes away once you advance phases. The same goes for every phase. Unless there's a card that allows you to carry mana over from other phases, your leftover mana goes away. You do not have to spend your mana every turn. You can save it or play mind games on your opponent like you have things to do during their turn. Next up is the combat step, which is split into multiple smaller phases. To signify that you are starting combat, you will generally tell your opponent, combat, to signify that you are going to start attacking. The reason you do this is to allow your opponent to cast instant speed abilities before you start attacking with creatures. Sometimes there are triggers that happen as a creature attacks or as you enter the combat phase, so your opponent needs to have a fair chance to respond to them. Once you have begun combat, move to the attacker step. This is where you select which creatures you are going to attack with. Sometimes a creature will have an ability trigger when they attack, so you can take advantage of that then. During this phase, you also select where the creature will attack. In magic, you do not attack your opponent's creatures directly. Instead, you attack the enemy player. You can also choose to attack a planeswalker the enemy controls if you choose to do so. Next up is the blockers phase. This is where your opponent can choose to block with their own creatures. Once they have chosen which creatures they want to block with, you may respond with instant speed spells to pump up your own creatures or possibly kill theirs. An opponent can also have multiple creatures block one of yours if they so wish. This is usually done to ensure that your creature dies and some of theirs lives. 
Next up is the damage phase. This is where damage is calculated and dealt. Damage happens to everything all at once. Everything will either die or live at the same time. Combat damage is pretty simple to work out. Say I have a creature with one attack and two defense attacking. An opponent has chosen to block with their creature that has two attack and two defense. Both creatures would deal damage to each other at the same time since there are no other abilities prioritizing damage like first strike or double strike. My creature, the 1-2, would die since my opponent's creature dealt two damage to it and only took one damage from mine. Now if multiple creatures were chosen to block your creature, you may choose to assign damage as you wish. However, if you are assigning damage, you must assign lethal damage to at least one of the creatures if you are able to. The final phase of combat is the end step. This is there to sometimes resolve any leftover triggers from combat. Next up is the second main phase. This phase is exactly like your first main phase. You may cast spells or whatever else you want to. Oftentimes people will cast creatures during this phase to keep information from their opponent. If you play all of your creatures in the first main phase, your opponent may choose to block damage differently, or not at all. Keeping information from your opponent is very important. Next up is the end phase. This allows your opponent to respond one last time before their turn with instant spells and abilities. If you have more than 7 cards in your hand at the end of your end step, you must select which cards you will discard before your turn officially ends. The last phase is called cleanup, which is where any leftover effects like discarding cards to make your hand size go down to 7 will take place. All of these phases combined make up one turn. You keep going back and forward in turns until one player is the winner. This is usually determined by one player making the other's life total go to zero, as is tradition in these types of games. Most of the time though, you end up skipping a large portion of these just a shortcut. If I have no creatures and nothing else to do, I'm going to just say pass turn, signifying that I'm not going to go through the rest of the phases. Magic also has a lot of other rules in place to win the game. If a player cannot draw cards from their library, they lose the game. So some players employ a strategy called milling where they actively try to make opponents discard cards, draw more cards, and make them place cards from their library into their graveyard. There are also other fun cards out there that just make you win the game. For example, Laboratory Maniac gets around that draw card rule, where you actually win the game if you don't have any cards to draw. Door to Nothingness is another popular one. It requires 10 mana to activate, which is a lot, but if it's activated, you can make target player lose the game. So if you're really feeling generous, you can make yourself lose the game. The last little bit of advice I want to give you here is to just always read the card. If you ever have a question about a card, try reading what it says. The cards always do exactly what they say. If a card says your lands do not untap during your untap step, then it means your lands do not untap during your untap step. If a card says you cannot lose the game, then you cannot lose the game as long as that card is in play. Platinum Angel is always a card that newer players go crazy over since it literally says that, but keep in mind that this is just a creature and it can be destroyed like everything else in the game. If you ever have questions about rulings or what a card does, try using that website I mentioned earlier, gatherer.wizards.com. It actually answers most of the questions. However, if you ever need help figuring out how damage works, you can find some live chats with magic judges to help you answer your questions. I've used chat.magicjudges.org slash mtgrules in the past. And that about does it for this very first video. I hope you all found this information helpful. If you enjoyed it, a positive rating would be appreciated, as I'm trying to make more content about magic on this channel. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.